So, of course, all of these uh, uh, flaws were there. Uh, yet, from a modern perspective, I would argue that the Athenian system had a number of attractions. The American legal system and court procedures have been blamed for excessive technicality verging on incomprehensibility and for the central role of lawyers and judges, which give an enormous advantage to the rich <coughs> who can afford to pay the burgeoning costs of participating in the legal system. The absence, typically, of a sufficient deterrent to unfounded lawsuits has helped to crowd court calendars. Time spent in jury selection, which didn't take any time at all, of course, in Athens, and wrangling over legal technicalities stretches out still further a process that has no time limit. It is not uncommon for participants in a lawsuit to wait for many years before coming to trial. Sometimes the plaintiff has died before his case gets to court. <clears throat> not everyone is convinced that the gain in the scrupulous protection of the participant's rights in an increasingly complex code of legal procedure is worth the resulting delay and some point to the principle that justice delayed is justice denied. Often in our courts, decisions are made by judges on very remote, difficult legal or procedural grounds that are incomprehensible to the ordinary citizen. <clears throat> As a result, there is much criticism of judges and lawyers and a loss of faith in general in the legal system. For all its flaws, I think the Athenian system was simple, speedy, open, and very easily understood by its citizens. It did contain provisions aimed at producing moderate penalties and at deterring unreasonable lawsuits. It placed no barriers of legal technicalities or legal experts between the citizens and their laws, counting, as always, on the common sense of the ordinary Athenian. I don't know how many, what percentage of the <coughs> uh, representatives and senators in our Congress are lawyers by training, but whatever that figure is, it's far too large. <coughs> I, I <coughs> it's really extraordinary that we all sit still for that kind of thing, <coughs> the kind of variety <coughs> excuse me, of profession that one can find in our society is absolutely not <coughs> uh, to be seen in our government institutions. Well, the Athenians would never permit anything so undemocratic as that. <coughs> Secondly, it is most unlikely that many fools or incompetents played a significant part in public affairs. <coughs> Of course, that's the flip side of rejecting uh, expertise and experience. You, you may end up with people who don't know what they're talking about in any shape, manner, or form having influence. Well, the Athenians knew that, and they were worried about it. <coughs> and uh, I think that they uh, did so perhaps, uh, they, th that the, the possibility of uh, idiots, fools, jerks, and other unworthies <coughs> uh, dominating the uh, political decisions, I don't think that it's clear that we are better off than they are in this respect. I often, I'm, I remember William Buckley once said he would rather be ruled, governed by the first 40, whatever he said, 40, 50 people in the Boston telephone directory than by the Harvard faculty. I thought we could all, we could all agree with that. <laughs> Maybe even the Yale faculty. <coughs> um, I think that, um, it's, we ought to think a little bit longer before we assume our system is the only way one can think about conducting a democracy. <coughs> but to get how, at the, how the Athenians cope with this problem, the, the, the assembly itself was a far less unwieldy or incompetent body than is generally assumed by its critics and that you might ordinarily think would be the case if you've got five, 6,000 people out there trying to make a decision. <coughs> think of this. If an Athenian citizen attended no more than half the minimum number of sessions held each year, he would hear 20 sets of debates by the ablest people in the state, 
chiefly elected officials or those who formerly had held elective office, the leading politicians in all factions, <coughs> and a considerable number of experts on a variety of subjects who would simply get up and express their views. And these were true debates in which it was not possible to hold to prepared remarks and look at your, uh, what do they call these books that they use, the policy books or whatever. <coughs> uh, they were real debates and the speakers had to respond extemporaneously to difficult questions and arguments from the opposition. Nor were they, they irresponsible displays, but serious controversies leading immediately to votes that had important consequences for the orators and their audiences. Now, if you assume that each attendant at the assembly <coughs> had been listening to such discussions for an average of only 10 years, and many of them would have had a much longer stretch, think of it, think of it. Such experiences alone must have fashioned a remarkable body of voters, probably, I would argue, more enlightened and sophisticated <coughs> than any comparable group in history. Apart from that, every year 500 Athenians served on the council, where every day they gained experience in the management of Athens affairs, from the most trivial to the most serious, producing bills that served as the basis for the debates and votes of the assembly. So, in any particular assembly, thousands of those attending, perhaps a majority of them, would have had that kind of training on the council. In light of that breadth of experience, the notion that decisions were made by an ignorant multitude is simply not persuasive.